Let's wait for one minute. Welcome everyone. So this slide I'm sharing, this is International Center for Theoretical Let's wait for Physics. One minute. This is Abdus Salam Institute, Abdus Salam ICTP. This is called Abdus Salam International Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste. This is a place that Dr. Abdus Salam uh, made his, put his Nobel Prize money into setting this up. So this uh, left side picture is just a view from uh, some distance and the right side picture is the closer picture of one of the guest houses. There are two guest houses there for visiting scientists that go there. So I've been there a few times and for researchers, this is a, a an amazing place to, to look for. They, they ask to write a proposal to do some research and in summer you can visit there. They, many times they take care of all the resources for people who are coming from developing world. We did a conference there a few years ago. The right side picture is from there. So Dr. Abdul Salam is a Nobel laureate of Pakistani region and his uh, the center is open for people from all nations, especially from developing countries. So is a quote from him, scientific thought and creation is the common and shared heritage of mankind. We have been uh, working on homework by, or based on the paper by Feynman. So let's think about it. Uh, what are these, some of the things that strike you as interesting when you read the paper? Let's share some common knowledge of what we have learned or what are some of the things you think are exciting. So let's talk about it. Let's discuss. Of course, I asked you for molecular manufacturing. So that's one of the interesting things that he has talked about. What else? Class, this is a, for you. Let's share what, what have you learned from reading that paper or that talk? And what are some of the things that came out like very interesting to you. Uh, I want to answer. From the Feynman's paper or his talk, share what are some of the things that you, you think are very interesting in that. Of course, you have, uh, some of you have submitted the homework from LUM, some of you have just read it for. So what are some things that you feel are interesting? Um, I'm on the answer. From the fine man's paper, fine man vision. He talked about molecular manufacturing. What else did he talk about? Uh, sir, he had a vision for the future about... Um... So give me some examples that you think is futuristic in his talk. So you say you talk about future. What do you think was futuristic? You talked about self-replication? Yes, I think that, that would come under manufacturing, wouldn't it? Right. So we're just asking about some of the things that you think were interesting. So that's what I want to hear from you. What are some things that you felt were interesting about it? Like writing on small scale also? Uh, right, so he mentioned, um, I think it was the encyclopedia that he wanted to write on the head of a needle. All right, so encyclopedia and, on needle, very good. And I think yes. his he was visionary in the sense that um, he had an idea of being able to store a lot of data uh, Data in storage, small... yeah, interesting. So that's that's the kind of thing I'm looking to hear from you guys. What else? What else strike out to you that that was interesting? What else? Uh, 
They talked about tiny hands. Um, also, he said he had a general idea of like a backup of data. Like he was already thinking about having a backup in case uh, a library burns down. So they right. have a record in a like I guess you, that comes under data storage too. It's okay. All the all the different things. Let's write down all the different things that that strike to you as interesting. We talked about systems that no don't need lubrication. Right, so we see that all the systems need lubrication. And last time we were talking, things become too small; they don't settle. There's no gravity. Maybe there's we can get over friction also. But these are some of the things which are which are all right. So I see some message is coming in chat also. All right, DNA pattern study. Okay, fantastic. So, Mohammed. Uh, smaller computers. Small computers. Small computers. All right. Now we are talking. I see some people are typing. That's fine. Self-replicating molecular machines. All right, fantastic. He talked about electron microscope. All right, that's also something that somebody has typed. Very good. So better magnification electron microscope. Better magnification. All right. So not just magnif, not just electron microscope, but a, but better magnification. All right. Very good. What else? He talked about medical devices also, right? Repairing human cells. Somebody remembers that? So if you think about it, and I just put up some things here on the slide, just to cover, if you, if you read that, and that's where you can underline or highlight those things, and that can, they can go a long way, especially when you're talking later in this course about interdisciplinary kind of thinking. Computers smaller than bacterium. Computers solving problems self-consistently. Artificial intelligence, that's what we're talking about. They don't, if they become smart enough, they can do deep learning or they can have enough power, they can, they can solve problems without human intervention. Medical devices able to repair human cells. So these are some of the things which you can write about in your homework, which is due this Sunday, right? So. From then until now, there's a lot of things have happened. We have now capacity to make things at, at millions times scale. So this is a real picture of nanopores. So using a membrane and then we are making nanopore. So this, the, the image on the right bottom, I, that, that's about 20 nanometer. So this is a hole. We make a very small hole in a membrane and we can use it to detect DNA. So we have now equipment where we can look at individual atom. We can manufacture things at that scale. There is an interesting thing. We cannot just manufacture things at small scale. We can manufacture those things controllably and repeatedly. That's what you call manufacturing, right? In manufacturing, you want to make every product according to some standard, according to scale. That's what we call repeatedly. And if we can make it repeatedly and we can control features, that's, that gets into manufacturing. With the advent of micro technology or nanotechnology, now we have many more things, many more systems where we can manipulate things at small scale. There's another example of what we call atomic force microscope. Atomic force microscope is we make very sharp tips and we drag those tips on the surface and we can measure nanoscale ups and downs on a surface. It's like reading braille code. Like uh, people who are blind, their language is in small dots, raised dots, or small, what do you call that? Uh, valleys on the surface so they can feel ups and downs same way we have now 
equipment with which we can look at things, we can feel things, we can sense things at small scale, at atomic scale. I showed you a picture a few days ago from IBM where they used something like STM, scanning tunneling microscope to move one individual atom and bring them in a circular shape. So that's where we are now. And not just in equipment, but production. If you think about it, now we are creating so many transistors in a year, more than the grain of rice that we grow in a year. So you count all the grain that you can produce in one year all over the world. We are creating more transistors than that. So that's, if you think about it, this is, this is amazing, this is huge. And we can not just create them, we can make those nanoscale devices to work as a circuit to solve problems, to solve digital problems, to solve measurements, to do measurements, to give us a signal, to give us a sensory output to human. And this has become so far away that if you compare people on the face of the world, there are seven and a half billion people, right? And there are 100 billion neurons in the brain in 15 centimeter cube. We are creating now 32 billion transistors on a chip. And that chip would be half centimeter by half centimeter. So this is a picture of a big silicon wafer that is coming out of production. And they make small dyes on that, uh, that big wafer in each dye contains now, so if I draw, so this would be about one die on, on this big wafer, or maybe smaller than that. And that contains, for example, in at the end of 2019, AMD's Zen-based uh, wafer, the, the processor had seven nanometer technology in it, 64 cores, and it had 32 billion transistors. So it has had impact on us where we are making things smaller. We are, because we can make smaller, we can make many more of them together. 64 cores, instead of just one processing core, we have now 64 cores in there together. So going from this PCB based circuit where we have discrete parts, we are making everything in an integrated circuit and we are pushing all these discrete components inside that wafer, right? So that's the jump. And jump is so huge. This A13 chip by Apple, what they call A13 Bionic, they have 8.5 8 billion transistors in it. And this is just a, maybe an inch by inch in size. So think about it, this goes in, in a cell phone. So it has so many transistors, so much, they have put six cores in it, six CPU cores, not just one, six of them. Now, some of them are dedicated for machine learning. So in a cell phone processor, we have cores and accelerators for machine learning. Now, where does that take us? That takes us to, now, why I brought A13 or, or a cell phone based and not a, a desktop because this is the computation power in our hand, not on a machine or on a desktop. So desktop machines are even more powerful than that. This is the impact. This is the impact of nanotechnology in devices. Now, if you go to living world, we see, for example, this is a picture of a, a butterfly wing. Yeah, we look at the wings, they are nice and colorful. If you put them in microscope, we see micro scale texture there, which is the second picture from the left. You keep on magnifying, you put it in electron microscope, like it's shown in 20,000 times magnification, we see nanoscale features at that scale. So what does that do? That's creating an optical device or an optical system where the light reflected is reflecting because of interference of light, 
giving out different colors. So we can learn from that and we can make optical devices, what we call now uh, nano textured materials or nano materials, where we can do the same things or similar manipulation of, of light. Another area where it's having a huge impact is biochips. For example, this is an example of a cancer detection chip. This is one of work from our lab from a few years where we can create nano textured surface within a, we pump the uh, cell sample from the left side, we push it and then you have a capture zone which has, which is basically replicating human tissue. The surface is behaving like a human tissue and it captures cancer cells because cancer cells do that. The, the cancer cells which are traveling metastatic cells, that, that's what they do. They look for another colony and they attach and bind and they start growing in those places. We can emulate the same thing in what you call a cancer chip. The left side top is showing you texture, nanoscale texture, which is almost like what exists in a living body. That's another impact. We can see that we can use this information or this knowledge of biology to create nanostructures. So this picture is showing DNA molecules are designed in a way that when you throw them in a solution, they reform, they bind, they make a square shape type of thing. They make a square shape, shape of structure. Now this structure, can detect other things. It can detect DNA molecules, for example, like it is shown here. So the A panel pictures are the, the DNA molecule designed in a way that once it folds on itself, it has a cavity in the middle. And B is the actual picture of those molecules having bound with each other and creating those nano structures. And then and we are looking these with AFM, atomic force microscope. And then we can measure the ionic current through them, through that small hole. We'll see what, what may be application of, of such small holes. We can use them to detect DNA molecule. For example, in this case, we have suspended an ion channel in a membrane and when molecules, DNA molecules travel through them, we can read that. So this electrical signal on the right-hand side, you get this dip in current when there is mechanical blockage of that, uh, of that channel or that ion channel due to the passage of DNA. So think about it. Learning from nature, we are engineering structures that are forming nanoscale structures that we can use to detect other biological molecules. For example, DNA, we can detect the genetic code for a person, right? We can look for genes that are related to be related for a disease that are known to be uh, genes for cancer, for example, or for other diseases. Now, in such a device, we are making an interface with nanomaterials, with nanoscale entities. There, the nanomaterials are having impact in products that we make. You'll be amazed how many products already contain nanomaterials from coatings, paint, medical diagnostics, even I put this uh, tennis racket there. So the, the racket material has nanomaterials in it. It's light and it's strong. If you pick up a racket from 20 years ago, you will see they used to be very, very bulky, very heavy. And they were not as strong as we can get them today. They have carbon material in that, which gives them strength and lightweight. Of course, we have talked about electronics a lot. We are using a lot more usage of nanomaterials in energy applications as well for energy generation, for energy storage, for energy transportation as well, right? So we, because we can uh, 
create novel membranes. We can, a membrane is a, is a basic part of some of the energy storage devices. We can create ion exchange efficiently. We can create the electrodes that can store more charge or they can store charge quicker, which means you can charge them much faster than we used to charge them. So these are some of the real applications that are already happening. We are using nanomaterials in construction now as well. So this example of using carbon nanotubes in cement, we did some work on that as well, where we can not just increase strengths, we can uh, work on tensile strengths, or we can make those materials expendable during heat or cold, right? So that's as an application on roads and pavements. So this is another uh, example of everyday things where nanomaterials are already having an impact. Now, there are day-to-day -day usage where it is already improved technology or already has changed industry. Because we have better materials, we can tailor the materials to our need and we can precisely get the property that we want. But there are many, many more challenges that are still out there. And uh, some of the challenges are in material design, they are in manufacturing, they are in detection of radiation, biological attacks, the chemical exposure, instrumentation, of course, electronics, healthcare, energy, microcraft, microbots, robotics, and environment. So I have few challenges that still may be out there. And, and these are open-ended challenges. And I hope we can do some discussion because these can help you maybe define some research areas for yourself, maybe help you in your research proposal when you get there. So environment, we have nanoscale materials where we are making uh, new things, but we can make better sensors there also. Why we want to make, why we say better sensors? Because smaller things can detect smaller changes. They can uh, be stable on usage on different applications, maybe in a heated environment, maybe in an environment where we have some radiation exposure. Maybe we can send them as swarms at some places. We can pack them, many of them. If we have a space, we can pack millions of them to get a better sensing capability. There may be uh, different chemicals that we want to sense, not just one chemical. So more sensors, you can have few sensors for one kind of detection, a few others for other kind of detection. So think about it. There are so many applications of environmental sensing. There is uh, applications in spectroscopy instruments. So spectroscopy instruments is where we want to measure specific signals for something very rapidly. And uh, it may be something that's in a very small amount, maybe in, a, in water, drinking water, maybe in air. So that's one big challenge that can nanotechnology can have an impact in there. And, and these are not uh, things that, uh, it's not a list, confined list. There are, you can expand this list and there can be many more things that where sensing can have help from nanotechnology. There is sustainable materials and resources. We, we hear the word sustainable, and it's basically the idea is that we want those materials that don't have impact on environment because of how we make them, right? Of because of already natural resources that we extract or resources, processes that we develop, we want to have less use of energy, we want to cut down transportation. So we want to create sustainable materials, right? So that's another area where we can 
maybe come up with some green technology, green vehicles, or infrastructure where you don't have to spend too much energy to do sensing or to do keep a keep track of how things are happening. Whatever, if it's industry, we may be interested in measuring toxic gas. We may want to check the exhaust that comes out and, and what are the uh, particles that are coming out. We want to optimize how people move, how goods move, right? So we have some areas where something is made and then it's transported to other parts of the world. We want to find a sustainable way of doing that as well. So sustainable agriculture is also another part of it, right? So where we want to optimize the production and distribution of food. So can we develop more effective and less environmentally processes? Maybe pesticides, less harmful pesticides using nanotechnology. So these are challenges. These are places where there is still room for innovation. So talking about sustainable processes. So think about it. We when we create things at nanoscale, we are using we are using less material, but what are we using to make those? If we are using toxic chemicals to do that, so that's problem for sustainability. So there is a continuous effort that how we can make eco-friendly methods or green methods to do these things. And what are the inputs that go into those processes? What is the cycle of how we do those processes? And uh, what is the byproduct that come of those processes? These are all the places where nanotechnology can have an impact. And when we understand the impact today, we can also see for future how these things are going to have an impact on, on everything around us. Healthcare, we, that's something which is more related to our course here, that what are the, number one, what are the impact of nanotechnology on health? And when we talk about that, we talk about toxicology. Toxicology is that we want to measure the benefit versus its impact, its negative impact. Trade-off, Hamza has said the trade-off between cutting the cost and impact of, on the environment. So which one do we prefer? So that's where there has to be a vision of using nanotechnology of, of making particles or making nanomaterials that are either the input is not toxic, there are no byproducts which are toxic, and the material that we use is not toxic. And toxic is, there's a definition of toxicity, we'll, we'll talk about that later on someday. And the idea is that it's, it should not be harmful for human health. And when you say human health, we're talking about exposure. We don't want to be exposed to something that we don't know how it's going to pan out, how it's, what's going to be short-term or long-term effects of that thing. When we make those things, and it happened in my lab one time that we, we got bought nanoparticles and somebody opened them and they started burning. So we we didn't know what maybe the, how you have to handle that. So if they need special handling, then that's there is a chance of accidental release, right? So there is room for studies of human. And this is something where lots of countries, and I know at, at LUMS also, there's focus on, on human health initiative, that how we make clinical uh, interventions better, but and how we reduce the impact of those things on, on living systems, especially human. And there's, you'll see as we progress, there's, there are lots of things which are already in the products which are already in the processes, but we don't know enough about their short-term and long-term impact. And that is a problem, right? But that's why we are doing this, that we can maybe think about some ideas on how do we better those things? Or how do we make us do a study of actually finding out what is their impact? All right, so any questions?